Hello everyone, this is Colonel Gallagher, uh, and uh, I'm going to go into the War of 1812. I've had a couple people ask me about this, believe it or not, and uh, I'm going to try to tell you as quickly as I can. Um, there's so much to start with, but it's one of the most amazing wars because it's really the war nobody wanted, <laughs> is the way I'd put it first of all. Uh, Donald Hickey, uh, who's a prominent author um, and put out a 200th anniversary to celebrate the 200th anniversary in 2012 of the War of 1812, put out a wonderful uh, anniversary edition um, on the War of 1812. He's the one I'd recommend the most is Donald Hickey. I didn't, fortunately didn't bring it with me, a copy uh, for Dr. Hickey. And um, there's several other good historians as well. Brian Kilmeade has written one recently, uh, not too long ago, about the Battle of New Orleans. It's excellent about how it shaped the American destiny. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I would highly recommend going down to New Orleans and seeing the Chalmette battlefield. It's amazing. Uh, and nobody really understands quite how deadly, how horrifying that war was. But uh, that battle specifically. But anyway, the War of 1812 really uh, known as the Forgotten Conflict. Um, but really, when you study it, most people didn't even really want it. The Americans were very divided um, politically over this. And the British were just as well. In fact, when war was finally declared in uh, 1812 in June, the Americans and the British barely missed each other sending uh, a note on a ship saying, let's cease these hostilities and have no war. Now, the main reason and the big focus is the Napoleonic Wars. The British were involved in the wars against Napoleon. And by 1812, uh, the British were hoping to kind of bring a close to this. Of course, if you know anything about the world history, the larger view, Napoleon had just uh, made a blunder trying to invade Russia famous blunder of, of many people in history. Um, and, and so Napoleon now, uh, after 1812, began a, a decline in a way. And the Brits now would, would put the Americans and the Brits at odds with each other. And it goes back to the shipping. And the British, uh, the War of 1812, an old joke is, when did the War of 1812 begin? Now we say, ah, it's 1812. Um, however, you could actually say 1811, specifically, in the West part of the United States, in Indiana, with a guy named William Henry Harrison in the Battle of Tippecanoe. Uh, there's a lot of issues in the West with the Indians. There's a lot of issues with uh, um, down throughout uh, uh, not only Indiana, but down along the, the western parts of the United States. Um, the British forts are up in Michigan. The British forts uh, towards the Canadian region, uh, such as Detroit, Fort Detroit. This was a huge issue that the Americans felt really they needed to get hold of it. This is why they controlled the, the Great Lakes became so important under uh, Oliver Hazard Perry. Um, and, and so any victory won on the lakes to control the lakes then allowed for transportation into the West to try to clear those British forts that were also supported by the Indians by a guy named Tecumseh. So you can actually go back before 1812 and see this building. And if you remember, I gave you a video on Washington and the big problems with, remember, with the French. Well, the French and the British were at war with each other in the Napoleonic Wars, and the Americans are caught in the middle of this, especially with the shipping. Uh, going across the Atlantic, and because of the American shipping across the Atlantic, the British controlled the seas, so they seized the ships. And so by doing so, uh, the British thought will cut off and choke off Napoleon's uh, supply line from the Americans in this case, and then cause problems. So the British basically declared war on any ship that's trying to support France. The Americans were trading. But likewise, Napoleon had to find a way to cut off the American trade to England. The Americans are caught in this situation in 1812. It's going to be very similar to what the Americans are going to be caught into a situation between the Germans and the Brits as you move into World War I. Okay, but before we get into the problem of the high seas and the shipping and the, 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 the Americans declare for neutrality, saying our ships should go through, uh, the British are now um, even stopping American ships. There even is an engagement called the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. Uh, you, you, have, you have two ships, the, the Chesapeake's the American, the Leopard's the British, and they, the British ship fires on the Chesapeake, causes a big issue. This is in 1807, so this is before 1812. Um, and the Americans made a very quick uh, decision in, this, in 1810 with what's called Macon's Bill Number no. 2. And Macon's Bill Number no. 2 was supposed to uh, bring both the British and the uh, um, French to a halt on uh, interfering with the shipping. And uh, Macon's bill base, basically said, whichever of you two stops interfering with our trade, uh, we'll deal with you first. We'll trade with you first. Well, Napoleon saw the beauty of this. He said, sure, I'll do it. Because Napoleon didn't have control really of the oceans. 
uh, since he lost his fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, his main fleet. And so now, um, by doing that, he put the Americans and the Brits on a collision course. Uh, this is 1810. Um, the president at that time was James Madison. He'd become the new president. He'd inherited this from the Jefferson administration. Uh, this problem of whether to embargo, you know, stop trade with, with Europe. And so by doing this, Napoleon kind of duped us, duped the Americans into this one-on-one uh, -on -one engagement with the British. But the British, like I said, didn't want this. I mean, they're involved with Napoleon. They don't want to have a fight with the Americans. And the Americans at home are divided over this. And they're divided especially geographically, but more so politically. So let me explain that a little bit before we get into the Declaration of War. is fascinating to read about in Congress. Um, the Federalist Party still around. Um, was absolutely against the war. They're anti-war, especially those in New England. They didn't want the war at all. Um, and uh, the New England uh, region uh, starts to actually threaten secession. This is the first time you really see this in American history, this idea of secession. It's threatened not by the South, it's threatened by the North. This place called the Hartford Convention, they actually drew it up in 1815. But 1812, they're already starting to say this. Look, if this is war, then we want out. And we'll even, we'll even uh, secede if we have to and form our own country and then negotiate with the British on our own because they're the main manufacturing center and trade with the British were very, very important to them. Uh, in fact, what's funny about the war is when the war is finally declared, the, the state of Massachusetts um, kind of half-heartedly did this and it was wonderful. They raised the regiment that said, well, we're going to raise a regiment. We're going to raise actually a militia, but they can't leave the state. <laughs> this is unbelievable. So anyway... The, Fed, the Federalists are against it. You see this in the vote for the for the war in Congress. Uh, almost every Federalist, almost every Federalist said, absolutely not. We won't have war. But almost every Republican. Now, Republican at that time is not the Republicans of today. The Republicans are the Jeffersonian Republicans. These are the Democratic Dash Republicans. This is Madison's party. And almost every Republican said, oh, absolutely, let's go to war. And most of them came from the West, the South, but mainly the West. And why? The Indians. So what's really connected here in the War of 1812 is what I call unfinished business. And unfinished business meant this is the American second war for independence. This, this term has been used a lot. Um, that the Americans said, well, these lousy British are now interfering with us for the last time. They won't get the forts out of the West. They're interfering with our shipping. You know, it's almost like a Rodney Dangerfield. They just don't respect us. And so now the Americans are determined to make this stick. Uh, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna make them taste American steel. And also unfinished business met with the Native Americans because the Native Americans now formed a confederacy under another leader, a charismatic man named Tecumseh. And Tecumseh uh, packed his holding, but he and the British were working together. And, and one of the things as you get into this war, one of the things that broke the back of the British in the West, especially when you start looking at those forts, is the Battle of the Thames. It's T-H-A-M-E-S, but it's pronounced Thames. And the Battle of Thames, Tecumseh is killed. And this broke the Indian Confederacy, the Native American Confederacy. So if anyone ever asks who's the big loser in the War of 1812, it's the Indians. They lost terribly because this really sealed their fate in that Western land. Who really also is another loser, believe it or not, it's the Americans. This is the only war. A great trivia question, Jeopardy for you. Who is the only country the Americans had fought twice and lost twice? And that's the Canadians. The Americans had about 8 million people. The Canadians had about 300,000. And the Americans tried to invade Canada during the American Revolution. And well, here we go again. In fact, in Congress, you'll find you'll find uh, uh, con uh, congressional on the congressional record speeches being made in Congress about how the Americans are just absolutely impressed with Canada. They want Canada. In fact, the funny part to me is we declare war on Britain and immediately invade Canada. <laughs> and uh, it's a horrible thing to read about. It's atrocious. It's it's horrible. I would never want to do this. It's all similar to the invasion, the Napoleonic invasion of Russia. Well, the American invasion of Canada. Um, and the Canadians find this funny. When we talk about the War of 1812, they're very proud of this. There's a wonderful book written uh, by Pierre Brunton, B-R-U-N-T-O-N, about the American invasion of Canada. It's a whole book uh, about it. It's gripping. It's wonderful. It's written in a very fast-paced manner, but it's a good history. I highly recommend it. B-R-U-N-T-O-N. If you really want to get it, Pierre Brunton, if I pronounce it correctly, I apologize, not uh, on the American invasion of Canada. Um, so with this, the Americans, they enter the war of 1812, like I said, they're politically divided over the war. They really don't want it. People are protesting. Let's talk about protests. In the city of Baltimore, for heaven's sakes, um, there's a group of Federalists there that are very anti-war and outspoken, and, and it's really a Republican city. 
And they, the Republicans go out there and they just beat the tar out of them in the streets. There's actually people killed over this um, because because of basically the frenzy, the, the emotion, the passion over this. Um, and uh, it's insane when you read about this. College campus riots basically are going on at this time. Uh, because when you look at the War of 1812, one of the first great questions is, were the Americans ready? No, 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 the Americans were not. In fact, what came out of the War of 1812 what emerges as time went along, America found their leadership, William Henry Harrison. Okay. Uh, you're going to see uh, Zachary Taylor. Okay. Um, but you're also going to see in 1812, uh, another gentleman who emerged. Uh, you got Winfield Scott. I hate to not leave him out. Um, but the other one uh, is Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson before the War of 1812. Who in the world is Andrew Jackson? And where Andrew Jackson, of course, the most famous battle we'll get to in a minute is the Battle of New Orleans. And it's, it's something I highly recommend to, to investigate and to go to Shalmet Battlefield once again. All right. And the Americans wanted to gain Canada. Uh, they saw this as an advantage. And the great irony is where the Americans actually did well in the beginning of the wars on the ocean, on the seas, um, with Oliver Hads of Perry along the Great Lakes, but also out in the oceans. The Americans did very well. On the land in the beginning, we did terrible. The Americans did terrible. You really don't see a massive turning point, Battle of the Thames in 1813, but not until 1814 do you really get the Americans to get any kind of traction. And it's because basically when you look at this, we're not ready for this uh, end of the Jeffersonian administration. There's been this mass reduction in military, uh, defense uh, spending been cut. And uh, this is something that came out of the War of 1812. Some of the biggest results is the focus on peacetime uh, military uh, preparedness. Um, and so the, the, it's, it's always a case is you learn more between the wars because you look back and the war that's being fought currently is in the reflection of the war being that was fought previously. If that makes sense. Militarily speaking. So the Americans learned a lot about this and they, they really pumped up the idea of the military academies. West Point's already going on. In fact, we go to that Shalmet battlefield. You'll see a lot of uh, the idea of the earthworks that were built up. These, these are these are defensive barriers that really helped the American troops against the Brits, uh, although there was a lot of American luck, let me just tell you that, in the Battle of New Orleans. Um, so anyway, uh, with this sense, uh, the Americans, uh, 1814, aren't doing too well. Uh, the British Red States burned Washington, D.C. It's a good story to read about. Um, uh, the British just sailed right up that old Chesapeake uh, under a guy named Admiral Cochrane. Uh, and then later on, there's another one named Admiral Cockburn. Doesn't that make it fun? It's very difficult. But Cockburn's the actual guy who's the, the admiral on the scene. Cochran is really kind of running the show. Uh, and the Americans, uh, the, the Madisons, uh, Dolly Madison, and James Madison, they have a big dinner for about 40 people sat at the table. And here come the British. And so they have to grab everything. Of course, Dolly Madison grabs a famous portrait of George Washington because the British would deface it. Um, and then they skedaddle out of D.C., uh, go a little bit further to the west, this place called Little Falls in Virginia, set up temporary shop about 40 miles away. And then in D.C., the British would enter um, and the British would then look at this and find these this, this dinner setting this for 40 people, sat down and began to eat, uh, uh, made toasts and so on like this um, to each other. And then they, they cursed the Americans and they did the horrible act of uh, vandalism to the Americans, burning the White House burning the Department of War and so on like this all the way uh, through the major buildings. Um, and uh, the only one thing they didn't build or burn, if I remember correctly, is, is the postmaster's home and, and the post office, if I remember correctly. I might be missing a building. But isn't that fascinating? So uh, anyway, the British even burned down D.C. So when people talk about the War of 1812 finally, it's always like, well, the Americans didn't do very well at the beginning. It took a while. Um, and there's a lot of issues between the Americans in this war. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, Jackson and Battle of New Orleans. It's a battle that took place after the Treaty had been signed. The Treaty of Ghent, G-H-E-N-T, was signed in December, actually Christmas Day, December 25th, 1814, um, where the Americans and the Brits finally came to a conclusion about what they wanted. And the, and the war is always described the antebellum common status quo, meaning what was before is the same. There's really no exchange of territory. Uh, there's no uh, sense of uh, an indemnity. You pay me this, you pay me that. Actually, the biggest thing coming out of the war is the Brits let go 4,000 POWs. And this is horrifying because you're impressed into the British ships. This is not good for a POW. The British ships are a great place, you know, a horrible place to die. And so the Americans got back 4,000 POWs. This is something very important. Um, but really, nobody exchanged anything. Um, but the reality was it gave the Americans 
quite a bit of little clout. The Americans had beaten the British twice, this great military that they had. Uh, the British had also, uh, um, or the Americans had also gained a sense of spirit because of Jackson's victory in New Orleans in 1850. Jackson defeated a guy named Sir Edward Pakenham. This was tough British veterans who had just recently come out of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Americans defeated them soundly. Uh, when you read about the battlefield, it's just disgusting. It's war, um, which is not always favorable. It's not nice and gentlemanly. Uh, there's tremendous large amounts of bodies strewn the battlefield. Uh, and it's just brutal is the way to put it. Uh, the Americans even used a uh, nighttime uh, raids um, in, in, in this when you read about it. And like I said, you got to go to Chalmette Battlefield. Put it on the list. New Orleans is a fun place. Uh, it's a wonderful place where you're surrounded by rich history. See the see World War II Museum. Highly suggest that. But anyway, so Jackson had launched him into this, this hero status. Um, and so anyway, with the War of 1812, I'm trying not to be too quick here. I'm trying to hit all the right things, and I'm leaving quite a bit out. And I apologize. I'm a little tired of that, I'll be honest with you. But I'm anxious to get to a, a different set of, of principles here. Uh, I want to give you, what I'm about to do is give you a series of seven things, and they all deal with the issue of slavery. Because something out of the War of 1812, the movement West, the spirit of manifest destiny is kind of really born. And the Americans are eagerly, eagerly looking to move into this West now. Uh, and, and, and that's unfinished business, too. And as the Americans began to move west, um, so did slavery. Slavery expanded. Um, one of the outcomes of the War of 1812 is the American addiction, basically, to the is issue of slave system. It's going to grow tremendously. 1808, the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade is supposedly cut, according to the agreement made in 1787 with the birth of the Constitution. But in 1812, it actually ballooned. <laughs> the demand of cotton has now risen tremendously. And the Americans are now eager to get back to business, which they did. They're eager to put money into the internal improvements, the building of canals, uh, the building of, of connecting the different markets of the United States together. This is the transportation revolution. This is an industrial revolution. Eli Whitney, not only the, the cotton gin, but Eli Whitney and interchangeable parts. So all of this is now really starting to balloon. The Americans are extremely proud of themselves. Uh, they write all these wonderful things, including the Star Spangled Banners written by Francis Scott Key, a lawyer uh, outside Fort McHenry uh, in 1814. And so the Americans are filled with this pride, this zest, this energy. And uh, now the war is over. They're ready to conduct business. And there's not another great American war for quite a while after the War of 1812. When you look at it, there's going to be a war with uh, Mexico, 1846-48. Uh, that's the next one. That's part of that westward expansion. That's issue of slavery moving. That'll be something we'll talk about later on. But we're going to look at really seven things, uh, starting with the first thing. We'll look a little bit at Missouri crisis and Missouri compromise. And then from there, uh, move into a series of things dealing with slavery. OK, and slavery became the big elephant in the room. Nobody wanted to talk about. And it's an important piece of American history. It's one of the most contradictory pieces when you think of American history, obviously, uh, between the great American principles of freedom equality, and then you got slavery. It just made no sense. Um, yet slavery was so entrenched and so intertwined in the American experience, it was difficult uh, to dis disentangle that. And it became a, a big question and a big issue. The War of 1812 helped the Americans find a sense of excitement, a, a sense of pride, a sense of morale, but they had uh, more unfinished business, uh, which was these issues of as you move west, in this new spirit, you cleared the British out of the forts, okay, which is territorial integrity. Okay, and to the Indians, it sealed the fate. They're going to they're gonna begin to get a series of treaties, and uh, they're going to have to move, including the Indian Removal Act <laughs> under Andrew Jackson, uh, 1830, and finally the Trail of Tears in 1838. You can all basically take it back to the War of 1812. So the War of 1812 is a big watershed moment. I didn't even get into the military enough, and I apologize. It's fascinating, but... I recommended a couple books. Donald Hickey's War of 1812 is wonderful, uh, as well as several others. Languth, A.J. Languth, if I said his name right, he's written a couple books on War of 1812, but his recent one is wonderful as well. And Brian Kilmeade is excellent on the New Orleans. Uh, so anyway, uh, stay tuned because I'm going to get into that seven-part series. If you don't mind, I really want to get into this issue of slavery and, and build it into the concept of finally leading up to the Civil War. But looking at those seven pieces, uh, there are going to be seven major events, and each one really gives, gave insight into what was going on in the American mind 
as this movement west. This is where we're going. We're going west, young man, young woman. We're going west. Okay. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.